Welcome back to another episode of Sports Medicine on Tap. My name is Brandon O'Lyne. I'm sitting at Neck of the Woods Brewing Company on an extremely hot, hot summer day. Well, almost summer day in South Jersey here um, with my good friend, Dr. Frey, and our new guest, Dr. Joanne Ballard. How you guys doing? Good. Thank good. you. Spectacular, man. Tonight's going to be a little bit different type of discussion. So we brought Dr. Joanne Ballard in, and she is an associate professor of health and exercise science at Rowan University, where I also work a certified mental performance consultant through the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, a certified strength conditioning specialist through the NSCA, and the owner of Absolute Fitness Performance Psychology, and she also serves as the NCAA faculty athletics representative for Rowan Athletics. So we are colleagues in our world of life, and we kind of are meshing this together, and we're taking a little deep dive tonight in the world of mental health and athletics, a very, very broad and big umbrella term when you say it, mental health, especially nowadays. Um, so we're going to take this a little bit all over the place, but we'll see where we go. That's a lot of hats. A lot of hats. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And we forgot a couple things, I think, on I that know. too. <laughs> I just keep going. <laughs> She's a teacher and a pra- practitioner uh-huh. all in one. Yeah, yeah. A business owner. A business owner, yeah. That's sure. all over the place. So kudos to you for doing all that Thank stuff. you. Thank right. you. Um, so before we go ahead and get started, we just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Virtual Orthopedics and Spine. From runners need a dog walker's hip to yard work back and laptop wrist, they've got a doc for that. Find the right specialist for you at virtual.org slash ortho. Um, so again, quick shout out to our sponsors, Virtual Orthopedics. Thank you for supporting our show. And um, if you need anybody, virtual.org slash ortho. There's a doc for that. Yep. Now, now this is, I don't know, the timing was a sort of interesting uh, mm-hmm. to, to, to go down this road, right? There, mm-hmm. were, there were two topics. I think that are really way out of our league in yeah. terms of ability to discuss. The main topic that we're going to go down the road of is, 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 is really pretty, pretty, is a very serious and sort yeah. of somber topic. And mm-hmm. we're going to talk um, a little bit about uh, Grayson Murray, a mm-hmm. uh, golfer who recently committed suicide. Mm-hmm. And um, just get into that a little bit and some of the pressures of, the, of that world. Mm-hmm. But then also, you know, timing as it works out, I think I think kind of on the forefront, you know, uh, it is the Olympics right on the horizon, mm-hmm. sports <clears throat> performance, improvement, coaching, um, and then Simone Biles, her, what happened to her in Tokyo, mm-hmm. and now, of course, comes back to the forefront. So it just seemed to, seemed to really make sense. So thank you very much for, for coming on to talk about some of this stuff with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so... Just to give a little backstory, and again, this is one of those more serious topics, um, to discuss the story of Grayson Murray. Over, it was Memorial Day weekend, I believe. It was on May 25th, which was a Saturday. It was announced that he did die by suicide, um, and that he recently had pulled out of the PGA Tour that Friday previously. So he had previous, um, he pulled out on that Friday, um, citing an injury, I believe, what the articles were saying. Um, and then he was unfortunately found the next day, morning, um, and then they made a press release about it. Um, he had a history of alcoholism, depression, and anxiety. Um, he had a lot of different things going on, and I read an article <clears throat> that said back in January of this year, he had been sober for about eight months, and he was engaged and to be married. Um, he had recently become a Christian and felt that his best golf was ahead of him. He um, was also appointed to the 16-member player advisory council. So it seemed, you know, I mean, this is about six months ago now, um, that everything was going in the right direction, things were going good. You know, he was sobered up from his history of alcoholism and other things. So everything looked okay, but I think that's kind of the big issue is that everything usually can look okay on the outside looking in. Um, it can, everything can look like all sunshine and rainbows on the outside, but on the inside, it's not doing so well. And it's just, as practitioners, like we all are in different aspects of sports medicine, it's hard to pick them all up. It's hard to, you know, there's some that you don't catch or you know you have these stories of, uh, of athletes who unfortunately take their own lives and you're like ah could how can that be how can that be and c- can it be stopped can we can we do something what, about what could have been done it? right right and, and it's like did we miss something did i miss yeah. like yeah yeah did, did say something like this and i should have reacted otherwise like that and we do you know um different various trainings in the world of sports medicine you know we have uh, mental health questionnaires in our pre-participation exams that we have and we that require follow-ups and other things like that. So nowadays you try to get ahead of it, but it's still one of those topics that it's so hard to. Yeah, so, you know, I guess first question being uh, for Dr. Bollard, and I, I, you know, I get it. You can't, I don't know that you can fully answer the question. It's probably not a very fair question, but but the first question is, how can that be, right? Like what, what's going on with someone who, 
would otherwise appear to be kind of like have everything to live for being on top of the world and yet yet they're in this uh, you know kind of deep dark place absolutely and that's a good question <laughs> and I, I wish I had the 100% answer right. for that but when we think of mental health it's a continuum mm -hmm. so on one end of the continuum we have the resiliency and we're thriving and on the other end is when we have mental illness and that takes us away from being able to produce in our normal life right. and since it's a continuum we're always ebbing and flowing so of course you know what people are seeing from the outside they could see somebody as successful or they look up to that person or they're idolizing them or what they're posting on social media mm -hmm. or how other people are describing them and then when we hear news about athletes and individuals we, we do ask those questions right. how did i miss it what could i have done um and really it's as a practitioner education right you know education and learning what resources are in your corner to help you begin to identify but also being able to create that safe space where individuals can build that trust and rapport and vulnerability but there's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. right yeah you know one of those things about that stigma that goes into it is um you know dr blard and i we we had a event at rowan this past year called a uh, helinski's hope and they had a, you know, it was the parents of a, a former D1 college football athlete, Tyler Helinski, who committed suicide, uh, I think it was later in his uh, career, like a senior year or something like that. Um, and they developed, you know, they came up with this program and they, they go out and they try to tell his story and to make, bring awareness to it. And, you know, that stigma was one of the things that one of the stories they had told in their presentation of that. Uh, Tyler had a friend of his that he was helping out who didn't have a car and he was taking that friend to counseling every day because he had a rough past of parents who had yeah. divorced or something along the house life mm -hmm. and you know at the funeral services his friend went up to his dad and he was just like I don't understand why he never walked 10 feet from the door to his car to the counseling center that yeah. I went in he right took there. me every time I never had a car he yeah. took me every time I had a counseling session and he never walked in himself right and that's what like that stigma is like a thing of like everyone's uh i'm too i'm too big i'm too strong you know i'm the starting quarterback of our division one football program i don't need to go do that or like right. and i think these discussions are meant to help break that stigma down like no it's okay to not be okay i right. think i say that a lot and i in my own practice and i you know in my world, I see athletes perform at their highest level, but then I also see them at their lowest point within a matter of minutes because they can go ahead and go hit that home run. They can go score that touchdown, shoot that buzzer beater, and then go a couple steps to the left and roll their ankle, tear an Achilles, or you know, blow out a knee. And it's like now their whole world is completely different. Yeah. Right. And you know, when admitting that you need that help in those dark times is really hard for some people to do, and it's hard to like. I mean, I don't have the trained eye. I'm like, oh no, you need something, and it's hard to do that. Yeah, and there's no one size fits all. Right. Like we all process, we all go through our emotions differently. We all have different levels of optimal functioning where we can mm -hmm. take pressure and anxiety and different strokes than somebody else. Mm -hmm. And what's a bad day to me might not be a bad day to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and another piece too, while you were speaking, I was thinking of this, it's that athletic identity side to mm -hmm. it too that could right. create a barrier for right. some seeking help. And and as you get to like even higher levels, and now, I guess, on a college level as well, with uh, you know the, the, the likeness and the NIL, oh, yeah. um, there are additional outside pressures, right? There are pressures from sponsors, pressure from attorneys, pressure from other people that are counting on you. And I think a lot of credit goes to uh, Naomi Osaka, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Phelps, and some, some people that are in, in small miles to, mm -hmm. to some of them, like who are trying to make it more everyday conversation, mm -hmm. right? Like and. and the phrase you use, it's okay to, to not be okay, right? Mm -hmm. We're all human. And mm -hmm. you can't always, you can't always be sunshine and roses. Like, mm -hmm. like, like sometimes it isn't. Right. And, um, and, you know, if someone's in that place, I, I think the tricky part is that when someone, I think when someone is, is, is in that place, right, mm -hmm. they're not thinking rationally, right? They're not mm -hmm. thinking about it that way. And that, that's what makes it so challenging. They, they foresee these obstacles. They foresee these pressures as insurmountable mm -hmm. or, or then... Or it's not. It's not even those pressures. They're just those pressures that maybe help them get to a place where they just don't see any way out. You know, like yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Or they could be thinking that because they're feeling this way, they're putting their loved ones in a bad position. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's a lot to take on. Yep. Are there any sort sort of 
uh, red flags or warning signs. And again, it's everybody's story is different, and it's it's so it's different for anybody. But there are any any, any things, any things that someone may say, um, um, you know, maybe it's someone throwing out a, a line for help that 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 could otherwise be perceived or missed. Anything along those lines. There's a lot. I mean, there, yeah. there's a lot. There's a lot. And, right, right. Yeah. And I think the first step is if you are in that practitioner role or in right. that provider world, world, it's understanding who that person is. Like, do you have a relationship with right. them that you know that this is the normal way they speak? Right. Um, that you they've given you insight into their day and into their life. And you can tell, like, mm -hmm. huh, you know, like so-and-so is always ready to go and energetic mm -hmm. and a leader. But today they're they're very quiet. Right. They're very mm -hmm. isolated. I wonder what's going on. In those cases, you know, maybe you could start that conversation. How's your day going? What's been going on? And see if they share. Right. Um, on the other end, it's when we have the extreme, you know, that maybe we don't know the person that well, or we just met the individual and we don't have that relationship to know their normal patterns and how we can address it. Um, words are important. So I always say in my line of business, you take words for granted. If mm -hmm. someone says something, you should err on the side of caution. Right. Right. Could they be exaggerating? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that. Right. And could you upset them if you do refer them to the wellness center or connect them with somebody? Right. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, as a practitioner, I would hopefully feel that at least I had the best intention right. For, right. for that athlete. Yeah, and I think it's hard because like... Um, Again, to, to mention the Helensky's hope is that, you know, in the presentation, they showed some videos of some press conferences of Tyler going through like that year. And he started off and he was kind of like, you know, very confident, bold and up there. And, you know, just of the, the highs of the season when he was doing really well, all the stuff. And then, like, they showed some other clips and his just whole his body language kind of changed his demeanor. His answers were a little different. They were kind of like pointing the blame on himself, for not like saying as much of a team aspect and like subtle things change. And I mean, you know. I would imagine that as a parent, when that happens in, you, in your world, you do go crazy and that you look for, you find, try to find an answer. Find, and so, that, you know, you know, I think his parents at that time were just analyzing all the stuff that he had public, all the public footage mm -hmm. and all the stuff that they had just to compare and look. And they found some things that they're, you know, little things. But it's also hard to tell because, I mean, yeah, you're not going to be too thrilled to be in front of a bunch of reporters if you just lost a big game. Right. And you're sitting up there, and it's not uncommon that we've seen press you're conferences, you know, angry. or down and about. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we seen big names like LeBron James just walk out of a press conference because right. ticked yeah. off? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. those things kind of happen, and it's hard to determine the, the differences. Like, oh, no, this is going really bad, or no, he's just a little mad. You know, it's it's a tough uh, tough thing to kind of really put your, put your nose on and, like, be right every time yeah. about it. And a lot of times, too, when you think about athletes and their team systems mm -hmm. and, you know, who they're living with and everything, they're seeing them day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So really, and this is what I think is so great about Holistic Hope and other organizations, is that they're providing education, but they're also empowering your peer support system. Mm -hmm. So that way you can become more in tune yeah. of if I notice my roommate starts to show mm -hmm. signs and symptoms, what could I do? Yeah. So let's say in a scenario where that that is happening, and, and it's it's the the college roommate of someone, and 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 that that person's having worries or concerns or fears. I think part of the the reason someone may not help their per, that other person is that they don't know how, they don't know right. where or who to turn to, or what's the first step they're going to take. Yep. Um, you know, part of it is they may not want to anger that person that that's otherwise a friend or like doesn't. But yeah. at the same time, I think a big part of it is like, I don't even know what I would do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are some of the steps that that person could potentially do? It's another very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it depends, obviously, the environment in which they're in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I work mostly in the college athletic world, mm -hmm. so I'll speak to that world. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, the relationships between athletes and their coaches are strong. Right. Athletes and athletic trainers are very strong, right? right. So that gatekeeper uh, in the professional side Many times they'll form relationships with athletes that they don't even know they're forming with athletes, but then they trust in that person mm -hmm. to be like, hey, my roommate, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. right. right. So it's not the peers or the student athlete who's the friend, their job to necessarily, quote unquote, fix the problem with no. their friend. It's their responsibility, hopefully, that they will reach out to the right resources. Mm -hmm. So that could be 
the wellness center. That could be a professional, a coach, someone that they trust in the athletics department, a professor. That could be a call home. Right. And that, or a hotline number, right. if it's something more immediate and urgent that needs attention in that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah, and I think um, to, to go back, we said with those relationships that uh, I have an athlete, as an athletic trainer is like one of the things why I love my profession is that we're one of the few healthcare providers that see our patients every day. Like right. we see, we see my, I see student athletes every single day in the ups and the downs and the, you know, the rain delays, the lightning timeouts, everything above, and we're with them every day. And so right. picking up those things for someone like me is a, not easy, but you can see those differences ha- changing or whatever. And it's always good when you get to a point with your with a, your patient student athlete where you're like hey man you, you, you okay like yeah. what's what's going on like you're definitely not you right now and i've you know i've been in those situations where it's like okay let's let's have a sit down talk and it's most of the time i've been lucky enough where it's just something simple boyfriend girlfriend drama mm-hmm. finals you know the big game i lost I, you know i missed a big shot i struck out when I, the team needed me and it's just like little stuff I was like all right and then you just kind of like okay well we're on to the next page we're going to keep going and you can give some help you know just some you know a little talk to kind of get them going but when you get those situations where they're it's not just like ah, i just messed up a little bit i'm just not feeling it right now it's like well when you go going a little like more somber a little more darker it's like oh wait wait a minute now we gotta you know align everything right yeah. and i have had to call the crisis hotline on a few at- student athletes it's like okay well you definitely need more help than i can provide right and i think that's a bold thing to do yeah, yeah. and it's just like listen i know i we're gonna we're doing this like this is not like a eh, maybe no no no, yeah. no we're doing this and right you know at the end of the day i think as my career has gone on sometimes it's just like i'm gonna do what's gonna make me sleep better at night for my student athlete yeah because if i go to bed and it's like ah, i should have did it's like i didn't do it good enough and right. i i don't want to do that to myself let alone let a student athlete or someone go go about their way with no help yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna relate that to a story uh, a med school story um, where um, uh, you know, I went to med school at Georgetown. Georgetown produces a l- large number of orthopedic surgery residents. Uh, at least when I was there, it was by far the most in the country. Like most schools would put out like, I don't know, two, three, maybe four per year would match an ortho in Georgetown. Like I think we had 18 in our class. Like, oh, wow. It was just a, a program that was really like sort of suited for this. Mm-hmm. And, and it was in part because the, the, the leadership, the, the guys that were running the program were very devoted to the program. And so... Um, in a similar and probably less serious version of this, uh, one, of, one, of, one of the docs, Dr. Delahaye, who was, was part of the program, um, went around and was talking about basically giving, giving you this clinical scenario of, a, of, a, of something called the compartment syndrome, which requires emergent surgery, uh, big, big open incisions, fasciotomies, this, that, and whatnot. And he was basically going around to each person, each, each student, and, and like, like, this is the scenario. Like, are you going to be able to tell that person, you have to go to the operating room right now? Mm-hmm. You need to go get your... Like, he paints this really overly dramatic scenario, but wants to know that you're going to have the guts to make that call. And if, if you're not confident enough when he's, make, when he's drawing this picture up for you, a very definitive picture of what it is, I think he has reservation about giving a good recommendation for mm-hmm. you. And, and I think that's a, a much smaller version of what you're talking about. Right. Like being an athletic trainer, you can help so many people in so many ways, most of which is kind of fun and good and exciting. But there's this side of it, too. And you have to have that in you, the ability to in that moment to recognize like this is if you think you see it happening. Mm-hmm. Are you going to be able to do that? Are you going right. to be able to push someone down that road? Or are you going to be able to say, "Hey, listen, I'm going to make this phone call for you," yeah. mm-hmm. because because that's like that, that's you know, it's a tough one to miss. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's hard because I've been in situations where you know you get a patient, student athlete comes, "Hey, can I talk to you about something?" And I was like, "I don't want you to say nothing." I was like, "Well, depending on what you say, yeah. I may have to say something." So like, right. I understand that I'm here to listen, but if you say the right things or you know the the correct things that I have to act upon, I'm going to do so. Can't not. Yeah. So by all means, I'm here for you, but right. do know if we have to go down this path, we're going to full send it and we're going. Right. You know, it, it's very very weird to be in that situation because you know I went to school to be an athletic trainer, and that's basically primarily orthopedic stuff. And you right. know, and, and, Huge then, part. and then I think especially as my career has evolved, it's become more of a prominent discussion, and it's happening yes. more often. And you're, we're having these trainings on mental health interventions or like things to look out for. So it's now I feel like the first 
five years of my career was more orthopedic based and all that. So now it's just like the holistic approach of like, you got to treat the whole athlete because you can even not get good results from your rehab if they're not mentally well. Right. Because they're not, they're not doing, yep. you know, they're not putting their best performance out. They're not getting the, the not benefits. Right. 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 And another piece of that too, what I see a lot is like clearance. Mm -hmm. You know, when they get physically cleared, are they psychologically ready to return? Right. Right. And that can be a, a big block for mm -hmm. them, a big hurdle for them if they're not ready. Right. We see it. We do. We, we see that a fair amount. We talk oh, about yeah. it with ACLs, I think, more than anything mm -hmm. else, right? Like, like such a long recovery. Mm -hmm. But Achilles and, and, and like, well, and, you know, like all these other, like, really long sort of return to sport type injuries where they put hours and hours mm -hmm. and so much of their, that becomes the focus of their lives mm -hmm. for, for a while, right? Like, like just, I got to heal from this injury. Mm -hmm. And then the idea to be at risk again. You know, yeah. like, I think there is this, this, this hurdle and like, why, why would I do that? And whatnot. Yeah. So it is, it, it is interesting. And we've even talked about scenarios of like similar things. Like I think, uh, this past football season, we discussed Nick Chubb and his knee injury. Oh, this guy already went through a multi-ligament oh. knee disaster. Right. And then he's doing really well for a few years and then it happens again. And it's like, it's so hard. That I, I could imagine. I tore my ACL in high school, and I know that, what that's like. And I've had those moments of, like, the first time I stepped on the field again. I was like, oh, man, this is weird. And the first time I made contact with another human playing football or lacrosse. or It's like, and you even even if you took a weird misstep and you feel a little something off in your mm -hmm. leg, you're like, oh, man, that's it. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. It's like, oh, wait. And then it goes by. and like, Oh, and then you slowly build that confidence up. But some people don't do that that way either. Yeah. You know, it's much more harder and um especially like the specific mechanism of injury could be very like a big trigger of like if you tore your acl playing football on say i don't know the arbitrary running back on a screen pass you every time you run a screen pass you're probably scared for your life thinking that thing's going to go again right and it's just like getting over that and i think where the perf performance side of things kind of helps out too is like getting over that next hump because it's all fine and dandy when your you know strength ratios are kind of even between your quads and your hamstrings but mentally you just don't want to do it or yeah. you can't and a lot of it that i see with return to sport athletes is acceptance mm -hmm. like until they're ready to accept and they could be fully through the rehabilitation right. and return to sport but if they haven't accepted the fact that they've been injured mm -hmm. and that there is a pre-injury version of themselves and now a post-injury version of themselves mm -hmm. That's a hard pill to swallow, yeah. but until that like click happens, they, there's a lot of that tendency, mm -hmm. and it can even be time of year, mm -hmm. weather. Right. Like there's so many there's right. so many obstacles that can come into their path. Yeah, and I think like with that said, is like with this whole topic is that all these external factors act as a catalyst to something if they're not pers or, uh, processed well by the, the mm -hmm. individual, right? Like right. for example, you know when I uh, when I was a different job, I, I had a student athlete who was a, for, a veteran and he uh, served in the Air Force, I believe, and it was in the Iraq War. And um, he was on the football team and we were on an away game and the, the host football team had a cannon every time they shot for touchdowns. And I had no idea <laughs> oh, yeah. what a cannon could do to somebody, just the sound of it. And right. I was standing next to him just so happened after we got scored on it and they blasted this cannon and he had like... Wow. It was a little PTSD type yeah, thing, sure. and he, he was not okay for a while. And right. I was like, and again, I'm on the side of a football field. I have a thousand different things I'm thinking of. I did not think that didn't see this coming. That yeah. that loud cannon was going to you know set him off in a way. And it was like, hey, man, are you okay? Like, I had to like, just make sure he was all right. Right. And then going forward, I would just kind of preventative side. is like I would kind of scope out the fields that we would go on for away games. I'm like, hey. The cannons on that side, you yeah. should. We should stand over there, and then right. we would just go stand on the other side of the sideline and stay away from it, and just little things like that. But never thought, and you wouldn't think about it. Just like, oh yeah, just nope. Oh, they scored cannon, Boom. goes off, but no big deal. Meanwhile, someone's standing there, completely like uncomfortable in their own skin, just standing in the highlight, just like almost shaking. It's like, yeah, oh man, there's I, a lot more to yeah. it. I'm kind of curious, and you started to go down this. You started to go down this road a little bit. Um, some of the outside factors. Um, you know, with, with, with Grayson Murray, there was a history of alcoholism mm -hmm. there and he talked about he was, he was sober and, you know, he had come out and he had won really early in his career had mm -hmm. won uh, a tournament. Yeah. But he had said later on when he was having some struggles, like I was not mature enough to handle this. Mm -hmm. I kind of came right into the tour from college and I shouldn't have, shouldn't have right. done that. Like I was not in a place in life where I was ready to handle that. And it, it the, the feel good part of the story is that it seems like things were going great, mm -hmm. right? He cleaned up, he sobered. I don't want to say cleaned up, but he, he got himself 
Yeah. Right. He found himself into a better place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I guess he found religion. He was engaged. He wasn't drinking. Wins another tournament. Right. And then this happens. It's, it's um, you know, and I guess there's a history of anxiety there, which may go hand in hand with drinking. I'm curious... Do you, because because of what happened, you know, three, two, three years ago within this world with COVID, are you faced with this much more frequently? Like anxiety became a bigger issue. All these other things. Are you, have you seen these particular issues um, and hopefully not quite to this extent where mm -hmm. someone, someone does eventually uh, take their own life. But do you think things are worse now from that perspective since we, the world has gone through COVID? And another huge, heavy question. <laughs> not, yes, another huge, heavy question. Heavy hitters only. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I mean, COVID, gosh, the pandemic absolutely impacted mm -hmm. us on so many different levels. Percentage-wise, yes, we did see spikes in mental health illnesses. We saw spikes in anxiety and depression especially. And that, that also could be contributed to isolation. Mm -hmm. As well as if you think about student-athletes, they didn't know that they were ending their seasons. Yeah. Right. Some of my research during the pandemic, I remember reading one of the responses. I, I surveyed like 700 D3 athletes, and one of the responses said, had I known my junior year that was my last game, man, I would have played differently. Right. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's yeah. dumb. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, I feel your yeah. pain. Yeah. Right, so we definitely saw a lot of change. They um, also don't have an outlet, right? They're correct. so used to having this outlet uh, for energy and emotion, and, yep. and also now you don't. Yeah. Right. And I think also during the pandemic that led and sprung a lot of research, mm -hmm. a lot of um, proactive, you know, support and wanting to learn more about what's really going on, right. like how can we help? So that's where we saw a lot of changes, a lot of revisions in things like the NCA mental health best practices and just what is the need? The need is shifting. Right. And how do we understand what the need is and then be able to provide resources and provide appropriate professionals and staffing on campuses, in professional buildings, and, and everywhere. So, yeah, so I definitely agree that, that the pandemic, I mean, we even talked about it a little mm -hmm. bit pre-show of how it changed just like the, the classroom dynamic students and the I mean, student athletes and just how they approach different things. It's, it's, it's way different than it was, you know, just... A short four years ago which isn't a long time right um but you did mention some stuff about the ncaa mental health best practices could you like talk about some of that stuff and kind of your role in that organization in that world and kind of like what the new the latest and greatest stuff is that's coming out of that sure absolutely so the ncaa has a sports science institute mm -hmm. and one of the branches is uh responsible for mental health and well-being of student mm -hmm. athletes and through the ncaa constitution Every institution has to have um, support for mental health uh, services on campus, as well as within the athletics department. Mm -hmm. So a couple years ago, they came out with the first edition of mental health best practices, which are basically like four different guidelines to follow. Mm -hmm. Since the pandemic, so much has shifted. More need, more research. Mm -hmm. it, I guess last year, 2023, mm -hmm. um, the Mental Health Advisory Board for the NCAA was composed of about 28 individuals, um, mostly on the professional side. Um, we had a couple student athletes from um, national staff serve for D1, D2, D3. I represented the NCAA Faculty Athletics Representative Association, and we worked to revise. We mm -hmm. really spent um, a year mm -hmm. uh, working on what what's the need, what are the changes. So effective August 1st, 2024, mm -hmm. is um, our updated mental health best practices mm -hmm. and it's available on their website now but um, we're looking into really providing what we do like what do we do if right. so really getting into the referral process mm -hmm. really getting into who are professionals that can help right because there's a lot of gray areas there and, and right. this was where we really wanted to identify who are those people right. like mm -hmm. who who can you call who can you lean mm -hmm. on what can campuses do so how do we support and promote um healthy campuses, holistic visions of campuses, and then what is um, the responsibility of the individuals on campus in the athletics department. What is the website that uh, you said that they're posting uh, basically the, the best practices on? So it's on... Is it the NCAA? The exact, you can go, yes, you can go to the NCAA.org. Yeah, yeah. um, or you could probably Google 
NCAA, NCAA um, mental health best practices and the updated versions should should show up and I can send you the link. To yeah. That's you fantastic. Want that too. No, and I think that's like, you know, that roadmap, kind of like you said, is pretty important. Like as an athletic trainer, we have emergency action plans for every mm-hmm. single athletic venue that you work out of. It's a, a baseball field, football field, indoor facility, wherever you have. You have a well-written out plan to see, say what happens if someone goes unconscious, someone has cardiac arrest or whatever. But what happens if someone has a you know mental health crisis? Like that's not it's not really well yeah. written out in most places. So very different. I think that mental health best practices is something that's going to shift that a little bit, and that's going to be you know I want to say back in 2017, I think when I was working at a, uh, another university, we developed our first mental health policies and procedures and we had no idea what we were doing and i remember i was like look i don't i'd have no idea how to do this i'm going to meet with the counseling service and people who are on campus that can at least help direct this and you know i don't want to say that this counselor or psychologist psychiatrist can do something that they can't right so let's have a you know sit down talk and let's say okay well you're, you're, you're able to provide these services okay how, how can i get an athlete who needs this to you effectively right. and quickly and at that university I was at, it was pretty simple. It was just like, hey, look, here's our number. You call us if you don't know what's going on. If you, you can't call us, bring them to the building. Just find a way to get them here, and we'll help you out. And, and I've taken – just was like, hey, look, we're going to go on a little field trip. We're going to go. We're going to go talk to some people who might can help you a little bit better. And they just had, you know, a room where you can go, and you can just – they would just kind of take you walk in, obviously based on availability. But most of the time they had availability to just walk in there and get things taken care of, and it just helped because it was like – I don't know. I would have been like kind of scratching my head for a little bit trying to figure out what's yeah. the best option. But that's why you set all this stuff up in place where like if it's a cervical spine injury, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know right. I can go down that list with my eyes closed. But when someone's saying all the different things and you, you don't know how to react or they tell you something that happened that you're like, well, this is really big. This is a, you know, a bigger issue. Yeah. It's helpful to have that roadmap yeah. again for someone who at least a, know where to start. I like, have right. an idea of you know, where, where, where to like, turn to, what mm-hmm. direction. Almost everybody, at some point in their lives, is affected or, or like feeling, you know, like like going down this road. And it's it's sort of like like I don't want to say it's sort of a shame. It is a shame. It's, it's sort of mind boggling that such a prevalent or impactful issue for such a long time was fairly taboo, right? Like like right. like, and that was part of the problem. And and it, I think it's pretty amazing the, the, some of the, to see the changes that are actually happening now, I think, like this generation kind of coming up right now, being a little more open about this and a little more honest um, about it. Because even before getting to the point where you, you, you reach out for help, um, you have to recognize the need for help. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then and then you have to know where to turn. So, right. you know, those, it's nice that, the, you know, the, the, that that it, it is, the, the plan is formulating, mm-hmm. right? Like, just like you're saying, you know, we've had all these other plans in place and a lot of sort of research has gone into figuring out, right, is it, is it better to keep the helmet on or take the helmet mm-hmm. off and all this other stuff? But like, you know what, like, like this is just as if not probably way more impactful mm-hmm. and, and the blueprint doesn't exist just yet. Right. And it looks different everywhere. Right. Yeah. So what works for one university or one, you know, athletic training office could look very different somewhere else. So it's really knowing like the strengths of who you mm-hmm. have, like who's right. working right. for you. That's a really good point. Right. Yeah. Right. The barriers that right. exist and holding people back. Yeah, and I think having those discussions and stuff it helps identify that. It's like, ah, we don't have this X person of profession on our availability. Do we have someone from the city, the county, or somewhere else outside of our university that could help? Or who's our best person within our university, within our in our in our neighborhood, if you will, um, that could help us with this? And identifying those and kind of identifying your weaknesses too is important yeah. to sit down in this discussion. Yes. And yeah. I think over, I mean, kind of like the over thing, the thing we kind of touch on is just having that discussion, breaking that wall down. Like, no, 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 let's just break the ice and let's get really uncomfortable and yeah. talk about some stuff that we probably haven't in a long time or have ever. Really hard to talk about. Right. 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 And I know um, we do a lot of stuff in our athletics department, at least with it, you know, whether it be even for our own, the staff's mental health and our student athletes, we have different things that, you know, we have different various meetings where even this year we had the pet therapy people come into our, a, a staff meeting and they just explain their services that they have for yeah. just stuff. 
It's like, oh, I had no idea that was even an option. I can call in to get a therapy dog come to my office because I had a rough day. That's fantastic. You I've know. been trying to get one to come to my class for a while. Like, Is I'm that right? Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's, we have a whole pet therapy program. Yeah. I think that's amazing. It's so yeah. cool. Right? <laughs> and just like little things like that. You And again, you don't really know until you have the discussion. So yeah. You just say, stop it. Let's, let's just let's talk it up and see what we got. Right. And, it, right. and I think it's also creating normalcy. Mm -hmm. You know, like you yeah. said, it's okay to, to not be okay, but it's also helping them. Like statistically, I think it's something like by age 24, when we look at mental health illnesses, mm -hmm. it's up to almost out of one in five adults, but it could be up to like 75% under age 24 is when they may notice mental health concerns. Right. That's a lot of emotional awareness, emotional regulation, self-awareness, mindfulness that they may not even have by that point in time. Mm -hmm. The brain's not fully developed by that point in time. Right. It's a, it's a lot to take on and to understand. And I think with that too is like you said the cutoff age was like about 24, right? It's like it's uh, crazy to think of all the stuff and all the pressures and you see all these things happen to such I mean, the college athlete is only 18 to 20 some years yep. old. Right. To handle all those pressures, to handle, especially like we mentioned before, is now that they have all these NIL deals, all this, oh, all this big money wagering. coming, wagering, all this stuff, and like, you know, the, really the, the crazy point of like, the transfer portals, like completely like a, like a stock exchange anymore. People are going in and going out, <laughs> going different places all the right. time, yeah. following different people. And it's just like, that's a lot to handle for. The, it's a lot to handle for a young, and then you you take. You know, specifically for a college freshman, someone moving away from home for the first time, right. living on their own, trying to figure all this stuff out. Right. They got this big bad coach that you know that they respect, but kind of fear a little bit, telling them that they need to do better. And they're like, ah, oh, I don't know what to do. And they're away from home, and they're in an uncomfortable situation. Exposure to substances they've not right. been exposed to previously or easily. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then it's a whole new world and how to take in all that stuff. And it's like even just coaching up that aspect of it how to handle all these hard changes and how to figure all that yeah. stuff is important of like trying to figure out ways to not get caught up and just get you know kind of lost in the abyss of the world of college yeah. athletics if you will and just and then post uh -huh. you know when they right. graduate another good point who am i now right yeah <laughs> right yeah. Some, some may not even think twice about it. they're like awesome Finish yeah, with that I'm one. done. So the next yeah, thing. Next thing, yeah. But a lot may really flounder. Right. And I don't I've just know lost my I identity. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. like, like it's, it's. How do I work out? Right. Yeah. I go to the gym, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Right. What mm -hmm. do I eat? Like right. things that you don't think about, but are absolutely factors that contribute. Right. Because I mean, you you can even see it on the national television scale of like former athletes who go into TV broadcasting. You're like, oh, yep, you definitely just don't know what to do yourself now. You, you don't look like you certainly did a couple years ago. You kind of let yourself go. You're just doing whatever. <laughs> or the opposite of where you see like I, a good example is like uh, any of the NFL offensive linemen or linemen who, you know, after they're retired, like, yeah, I'm good. And they just like cut a bunch of weight and they're super trim skinny up, yeah. and they trim up real well. And like, yeah, I'm just living a different lifestyle now. I don't need to eat all that weight to be pushing other big people around. I can just kind of do whatever. <laughs> some people work well with the transition. Yeah. And some people it's, uh, it's disruptive. Right? And, I, you know, I heard an athlete before say this and, it's, you know, it's kind of ties into the topic a little bit, but not as serious is that um, athletes kind of die twice. And it's a weird saying of like, they die once when they die, and then they die another time when they retire because that life of their identity is gone. And yeah. That's it. And they hang it up for the one last time, and then that's that's who they are. They're no longer – yeah, they might have a record in the record book, but they're not doing it anymore. They're it's just different. They're yeah. just a regular – a NARP, a non-athlete, real person is what we call them. You're just that's a NARP now, and you're just on <laughs> the real world. You know? Non-athlete. <laughs> um, but a lot of the things we talked about tonight, you know, is having the right person for the right thing. Yeah. Um, so just like our friends at Virtua Orthopedics, they have the right people for the right injury, whether it be runner's knee, dog walker's hip, they've got a doc for that. Yard work back and laptop wrist, they got a doc for that too. Virtua Orthopedics and Spina has over 120 providers, over 20 PT and rehab facilities, and more than 25 surgical centers all across South Jersey. So find the right specialist for you at virtua.org slash ortho. All right. So I want to I want to try to move on a little bit to um, uh, at least touch on some you know Olympics pressures yeah. and whatnot. So it's a, a clearly a variation of what what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. you know, we we're talking about the kind of the most devastating and, and serious scenario, the mental health mm -hmm. scenario, um, mm -hmm. and you know potential outcomes. 
but but on, on to a lower extent. Before we get there, one of the things that that I think was really important, like you know, I was talking with Brian, uh, you know, works behind the bar, right? But right when I first walked in the door, like he's like, heavy topic, man. I think it's going to be really interesting, and I think it's been very helpful. I think it's less helpful if we don't get to the point where we talk about if we give out some of the phone numbers mm -hmm. for some of the resources mm -hmm. yeah. that uh, that that people may be able to reach out to. So some resources that are available today, um, and even as a professional, what you can do to help and to share these numbers. Um, we have STAR 988, which is the Suicide Crisis Lifeline. We have the Trevor Project, which is the suicide hotline for LGBTQ youth. You can text START to 678-678 or call 1-866. 488-7386. And another great resource to share is NAMI, N-A-M-I, Teen and Youth Adult Helpline, and they can be reached at 1-800-950-6264. And I think with that too, is like those are all can be considered national yes. hotline, right? And like, I think it's important for anyone listening is to, you know, do a little research on your own and find your local uh, resources as well, your county level, state level, there's some options that could be available to you. Obviously, we, we can't go down a list of and just start giving you county numbers for every single state across yeah. the country. But, you know, looking into that stuff and trying to be a little bit prepared is also pretty helpful just to, you know, oh, well, we have these references that we just or resources we just mentioned. But, you know, in this county, we have this and some counties might have a little bit more or other. And it's like good to know those things because you never know when you need that number. Right. Yeah. Right. And I, I think I think also to, to, to check, like you said, NCAA.org and check the mm -hmm. blueprint and get, get get a little bit of guidance on, you know, best best practices, best actions. And, and then to transition from that. Mm -hmm. So here we go back mm -hmm. to the Olympics, Simone Biles. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, I, 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 you know, I, there was an article. She, they, they were just at Nationals and I read an article and uh, I find it very interesting. Uh, so so uh, Suni Lee, another uh, a gymnast who was competing at nationals, had struggled in the vault or whatever it was, and, and was basically like, um, she was struggling. I don't, I don't think she felt like she could finish her routine. She was getting ready, potentially getting ready to pull out of the competition. And Simone Biles goes and seeks her out and sits her down and has this conversation with her and talks to her and sort of asks what's going on and what are the issues that you were having and like, like why, you know, and then brought her back out. And I, I I think I think it was the uneven bars that she had mm -hmm. next. I'm not 100% sure, but whatever event it was next, Simone Biles goes and basically stands there uh, right at the event and is cheering for her and rooting for her and sort of helps her get through the routine and get back on track. And you know, you, you got to love that, right? Like they love mm -hmm. that someone who, who had had the struggles and went down that road is then uh, an advocate right and then sure enough here she is right like like we, we were talking about you know her and her pulling out of the tokyo olympics and you know the whole thing with the twisties in the air and it was a very i think a difficult thing for the average person to understand what's going on there um clearly it impacted her i think a lot of people thought maybe this is the end for her but then she comes back and wins more world championship um elite yeah elite right Simone <laughs> Biles is something else crazy so so first you know and some of the work that you do, this is one of the things that you that you do, right? Like you 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 have your own business. Um, you're the owner of Absolute Fitness Performance and, and Psychology, and part of that is coaching and performance and whatnot. I would imagine, from an athlete's perspective, that this is, and especially for a lot of the athletes that are in the Olympics, which aren't necessarily you know professional football players and whatnot. They're 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 different sports usually. This is the pinnacle. This is it. Oh, like yeah. this is the pressure cooker. How do you, and it, you know, easier said than done, right? Like you can't go, yep. but how do you turn that pressure to, to uh, turn it from something that's detrimental, that, 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 that's going to hurt your performance, that's going to make you shrink, that's going to make it hard and try to refocus it into um, something that's more helpful, that's a, that, uh, that, uh, a focusing agent and whatnot. Um, what, 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 what are some of the advice that you would give your athletes in try, sort of getting past that, that pressure moment and how to handle that pressure moment? Pressure and performance, when we think about it, I think I mentioned actually a little bit ago, different zones of optimal functioning. Mm -hmm. So right. we refer to IZOF, Individualized Zones of Optimal Functioning. And basically what it says is, I have a certain level of pressure where mm -hmm. I peak with my performance, mm -hmm. you have a different one, you have a different one. But we can all be 
maybe some on glides. I don't know. Right. <laughs> maybe right, we right, perform right. at that level. But, um, <laughs> but we have a certain area where we can take the pressure and be able to perform. Mm -hmm. But when we're too far above our pressure area or if we're bored or apathetic about something, we're not right. going to perform well. Right. So it's really working on helping that athlete identify where that sweet spot is. And that's by them really, this is the self-awareness piece, this is the mindfulness piece that they need to be working on, mm -hmm. is for them to start understanding how their body is speaking to them physically, mentally, and behaviorally. When they're feeling confident, when they're not feeling confident. And starting to identify, okay, what are the common ground pieces that we see? Where do I see that I did not have a good performance that night? Let me flip back. How was my body speaking to me? What was I saying to myself? Was it positive, negative? Um, did I have a lot of self-doubt? Did I have no self-doubt, right? And starting to be able to basically identify what was the change, mm -hmm. right? And if we can start to notify and understand what those pieces are, then we can begin to help them rewire. Because if they say like, man, that was a big pressure cooker I was in, but right. oh my gosh, I did it. Like mm -hmm. I performed optimally. This was awesome. Right that's your sweet spot. Let's, let's talk like mm -hmm. what, what happened physically, mentally and behaviorally before we even got out there and mm -hmm. help them rewire that it's not because we usually we we usually are wired where what is happening with me, like the butterflies, something must be wrong. I feel mm -hmm. sick to my stomach, you know, how do I fix this? But instead yeah. I don't need to fix it. Yeah. Let's like flip the switch in the brain. Embrace it. Yeah. Embrace it. Yeah. That's interesting. Is like, you know, that finding that, piece of just what is it that either makes you go or not go or like you know doing different things where i've like even or trying to even capitalize on like the small wins of like trying to find small victories in like a big picture like well you yeah okay we didn't do we didn't win the big game but right. man look how well you did yes it's it's a team sport so i yes our team didn't do well but all the things that you did well you you capitalize on all the things you might have been working towards that season or whatever, trying to take the like the little victories that you can find, right. um, and harping on the positive aspects, and not like overload the negative and other things like that is helpful. I love the word that you used, the, the rewire, mm -hmm. um, and 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 I'm gonna ask you to expand on that a, a tiny bit because what I hear and what, what what I start thinking, you know, sometimes when presented with with anxiety or the stressful situation. Um, the, the, the mind can go down one pathway and the pathway, you know, depending on where it goes, instead of going into a, like a rational or a reasoning pathway, sometimes it can be overcome. It can actually go down the, this yeah. fight or flight sort of primal sort of response, yeah. which may not be the best <laughs> for performance, mm -hmm. right? In fact, it can lead to like kind of like collapse, pulling out, like, like just sort of losing the whole idea or the focus of what, what, what the event is all about. Yeah. But rather, rather than learning how to, to, to take that and handle that moment and letting it go down that pathway and trigger that, that very deep-seated uh, response to, to send it somewhere else where it, it turns into more of a focus and performance, uh, profound, like, like that, the flow state that people mm -hmm. would yeah. otherwise begin to talk about. Yeah, a few things. So athletes always have previous performances, right? Mm -hmm. right? And many times, most athletes evaluate how they're gonna to do tomorrow in the game based on how they did in the last game or mm -hmm. what happened at the last at bat or what happened previously. Right. It could have been successful. It might not have been successful, but regardless, even if it was successful, they could have negative self-talk, um, self-doubt creep in. They may also have more fear right. based. What happens if, mm. what if this happens? Right. What if that happens? What yeah. that, right. And that's really the brain trying to protect you. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause then it can say, see, I told you that was going to happen. Like <laughs> right. Right. good. Right. But instead we need to strategize. We need to be aware of, it's not so much we wanna push away what you're thinking or we wanna push down that emotion. We wanna name the emotion, right? To understand what you're going through, like what you're experiencing. Right. We also wanna understand what are these what ifs, what are the fears, what are the doubts yeah. and state them, right? Cause then we can take the what if and put it into a strategy. So then you have it in your back pocket. Right. So if you're a swimmer and maybe one of your what ifs is what if water gets in my goggles, right. it could right. 50 percent chance if for yeah. anyone, it could happen, yeah. right? right? But it might not. Right. But if it does, you whip out that strategy. Yeah. If it gets in my goggles, I'm going to do, I don't know, two side strokes and get back to my, you know, right. and then you're ready for this. Right. I'm going to be ready yeah. for it. Another huge level is some athletes when they are fear based, self doubt based, 
it's because a couple emotions that as humans I don't think we enjoy talking about shame and vulnerability right they tend to spike yeah. and those are hard to talk about no one wants to really have formal discussions about that but that's <laughs> right, usually right. when shame and vulnerability begin to creep up is when we either self handicap and take ourselves out I don't feel good today my hamstrings hurting I got to go see the trainer right. um, I think I hurt my knee um, I got that stomach bug my roommate had, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. So they may take themselves out before they even have the chance. Right. Um, or they just don't have the confidence that they're going to be able to perform optimally that day. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with that too, is like, at least from a return to sport standpoint of like that, that fear that you got to kind of go over the hump of whatever it is. It's like, you take their rehab approach. It's like, I'm going to make your rehab so hard that like <laughs> a game is almost easy for you to like, right. see, look, you, you just did all that stuff. We just did, I don't know, four foot box jumps and you, you're afraid to like do a little, to hurdle over somebody or whatever the case yeah. is. Just like you just work through some scenarios and try to like, like you said, find that method or that um, strategy to like get around it and right. just not, not kind of fold under the pressure, but to like capitalize on it and, you know, go forward with it. And I think um, a couple of things that you said that about the, um, ironically, the swimming and the getting uh, water in your uh, goggles is that I, I read a book, I think it was uh, The Power of Habit, and they talked about how Michael Phelps, and we talked about Michael Phelps pre-show of like how electric the time was, with the Olympics and swimming and Man, Michael yeah. Phelps when he was Amazing. in his prime, how crazy it was. Yeah. Um, but apparently that Michael Phelps used to know, or he probably still does, know how many strokes it took from him to get to, from point A to point B in a pool at any point in time. And there was like, I think the one gold medal, one of the bajillion gold medals that he won, when he was like just enough, like it was like a millisecond between hands that he got water in his goggles and he just had to go back to his strategy of that I know that it takes arbitrary, let's say 17 more strokes to hit the wall. I'm going to just hit 17 and reach. Yeah. And he did and that's what got Despite him a gold gold medal then. Yeah. And it's just like those little things of like... Preparation. Kind of like when you practice being in a hard situation, you yeah. kind of can do it differently. And again... I forget where I heard about the study, but there was a study in rats of some sort that um, they had them try to go through like a tube of some sort and some of them didn't go. But if they came back, they kind of always came back. They never kind of pushed through and got to the other end. But if they forcefully pushed the rat through or whatever to get to the other side, they counted as a win and they learned the winning idea and they continued to do that. Even if they didn't do it off the first try, like they kind of forcefully put them through a situation and saw the positive end of it. And it kind of was like, oh, that's an interesting way of like, Sometimes you got to push an athlete like no no you, you're going to do this you're going to do this and obviously push within reason. Yeah. You know obviously you know I'm not saying you I'm just kids crying on the ground like no get up and keep going. No right. it's like you know in a safe environment and you're pushing them through to kind of show them that they they can succeed and hopefully that builds up that strategy like no I can do this. I can succeed and that translates into their you know return to sport or whatever the case is but yeah. it was interesting we talked we talked about Michael Phelps a little bit before and then that story of water in your goggles like oh yeah I remember that story. Like I, would, story. I tell people that story all the time of like just little things like visualization, positive self-talk and yeah. stuff like that. It's just stuff that sometimes can go just overlooked. And it's like, and it's amazing sometimes when you, like we said, we sit down and talk with these student athletes and you hear some of the self-talk and you're like, man, you're really not that, that's yeah. not really how you are and what you look like out there. Like, trust me, I've been watching athletes for a long time. Yeah. You're pretty good. Like <laughs> what you're and doing. And it's like, what, would you ever say that to your friend? Right. Yeah. And they're like, no. Right. <laughs> right. But we say it to ourselves. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's yeah. the unfortunate right. thing, right? Yeah. 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 You can say it to yourselves. And- Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's exciting. I love it. I love, I love this time of year. I love the, not, I love this time of every four years, I guess yeah. I should say. Uh, well, you know, every two, you get the little winter, a little summer, that's you true. sprinkle that's it true. in. So it's only two years, which is like, yeah. But it's the difference of like now we get like the, the summer sports, like yeah. the ones that you get to see. Yeah. And you see like, you know, the tracks. And, uh, and I think track especially is one of those hard ones, man. Oh, yeah. Like with the mental health and just like you're, you're trying to perform optimally. You don't want to misstep at all. You don't want to do anything. And, yeah. you know, track athletes in particular are very meticulous mm-hmm. about everything. Of course. Very yeah. similar as with the Phillies games on the on the background here. It's baseball players, too. Yeah. They're just creatures of habit and repetition <laughs> and repetition and repetition. Yeah. And it's like sometimes yeah. I wonder. I, I, I always, always want to see this happen. It's just like no BP, no batting practice, no like no crazy 18-hour warm-up for baseball. Just go out there and have some fun and see what happens. Right. And let's see what the, st- the numbers say because baseball is all about numbers. Right. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like it's a little bit overkill. That would be better, right? Yeah, just, just go out there and have some fun. And that's what's scary, I think, also with like our youth sports, <laughs> like our yeah. youth athletes. Right. They only know 
the structure that right. I know when I was growing up, I didn't have it. It didn't exist. It just go play, you right. know, yeah. or yeah. like travel teams at travel each teams, age. Travel teams, yeah. like, trainers. I'm sick of it. They, they want to go play outside, or mm -hmm. they just want to watch TV, or they want to go with their friends and do something right. that's non-structured. Yeah. But everything is so structured, so... You know, when's burnout going to happen? Mm -hmm. What injuries are they going to get? Right. I'm sure they're going to get injuries that you usually wouldn't yeah. have seen until right. college or later. Right. And it's it's interesting. Yeah, because then you can go down the whole world of uh, the whole avenue of sports specialization early at an early oh, age yeah. and how, like, detrimental that is to youth athletes. Yeah. And I don't know how many times I've said it on this show of, like, name any of the good athletes that you want to talk about. Anybody who's, like, Bryce Harper, Mike Trout, uh, you know, any of the... Kobe Bryant, all these, all, these, all these athletes are doing really well. They played other stuff. They didn't yeah, just right. do one thing their whole life. They right. played a bunch of different sports. Look up Patrick Mahomes' basketball highlights, or right. like you yeah. know, go outside yeah. the box. They just went yeah. out there. Aside from baseball and football, right? right? Like, like, yeah, yeah, more than one sport. Yeah, and, and you know, again, I, I, I said, I said it a few times that we're, we're kind of with my son right now. He's right in the thick of that where we're. Um, he's he's multi-sport athlete, plays a bunch of different sports, and he's getting there's a fair amount of pressure to try to to try to specialize. M my feeling on it is, you become a better athlete and you have a higher ceiling if you're able to higher ceiling eventually when you know you're you're at the pinnacle of your sport, whatever whether your pinnacle is going to be you know in in middle school, if it's going to be in high school, if it's going to be in college, or if it's going to be beyond, right? But your, your ceiling is probably higher if you were playing other sports along the mm -hmm. way, and at some point, yeah, you probably do need to then focal of uh, mm -hmm. uh, specialize and focus on that that one particular sport but probably not when you're young it's right. probably later in life if you focus on when you're young you may be better than right. the other guy when you're young but when you get older that other guy's probably going to pass you right. at some yeah. point or another and then um, it's scary that like i have four children and it's like if you don't start a sport by age six <laughs> it's crazy I it's know. done i know right it's you have no shot yeah. I mean, hello. Yeah. Like they can't tie their shoes. They can't jump rope. They can't like <laughs> right, right. things that scary. They just learn how to do a jumping jack like yeah. two years ago, and you're trying to specialize in sport at six. You know, like right. yeah, it's it's crazy. Now, now the fly in the face of everything we just said. There, like I, I don't know that I, 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 I through my life, I'm going through going through med school and going through residency. When you you come into contact with some pretty amazing people along mm -hmm. the way, and I've known like you know this person was in Olympic trials and Olympic alternate and whatnot. Right now, I, I know uh, of fairly close ties. Four people that are at the Olympic trials. Yeah. Uh, a guy, Henry, Henry McFadden, who swims out at Stanford. He was a, uh, went to high school at, Stan, uh, at Haddonfield. Uh, we know him. We know his family. Super nice guy. And he's actually swimming tonight. I think it's 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, to, wow. to see nice. if he, he's in the final to see if he makes. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then um, there's, a, there's Audrey Devereaux who's been kind of all over like some social media. She's 14 years old, man. She's a wow. freshman. And, Holy and, cow. And I will say, like, like there are people who I think dedicate their lives to this kind of thing. Like, they're homeschooled. This is it. This is all yeah. they do. And like, she goes and swims in the morning. She goes to school. She goes and swims in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But but she's still, like, that, that semi-normal life. And, like, uh, like to be out, like, five or six different sports. Like, it's yeah. amazing. Really, really, like, so, and her, uh, her older sister, I guess, she swims at Yale. I don't know the Devereaux. I just hear they're, they are very nice people. But she swims at Yale, also competing. And then one of my buddies, we actually had him on the on the show. Uh, a, a little while back, Scott Greenberg, who I grew up with, and his daughter is going to be diving on Thursday. And just best of luck to to, to, awesome. to, to all of these guys who are going to be out there competing. Yeah, yeah. and I think I'm that's you know that's the beauty of the Olympics, right? You get these like these other sports that don't have this major outlet. There's no MLB for like yeah. There's you know World Championships everything. but nothing's like the spotlight of the Olympics. You know right? that gold oh, medal. Yeah. You know that's like the best. Like you know. I think, you know, the Celtics just won the NBA championship last night. Like, yeah. everyone says that, you know, the, <laughs> yeah, the, we, we wanna, we're yeah. just going to breeze over that part. But, you know, I think it's funny where, like, these American-based professional sports leagues say they're world champions. It's yeah. like, well, you're just uh, the American champion, if you will, because there's yeah. – we're going to see who's the best in the world when the, you know, USA basketball goes out there and whatever and all that stuff. Like, the world world best is a lot different than, like, a oh, league best. Right. It's, it's – that's the beauty of the Olympics. Although sometimes some of those <laughs> leagues, like oh, yeah. best, like the like NBA. You know, yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, like I said, I think it's going to be great when the Olympics start and there's going to be so much more to discuss. Um, yeah. We'll see what, what, what it comes up with. Um, I think we touch on a lot of stuff yeah. tonight. We went, 
We started I, off with like I a, love the performance topic. Yeah. I do, I do. And I feel like there's so much more we yeah. can go into, but, but you know, for another time. I think we just show. did like, uh, you know, what Brian's, his favorite thing to pour is just a flight. We kind of did like a flight, if you will, of <laughs> mental health and discussion. Yeah. Um, and we touched on a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I think, I think it just calls for Dr. Ballard to come on again and we can just go down another avenue of different things. That's right. Um, I love it. So... First, thank you again for coming out. Um, you. Appreciate yeah, you doing sure. this. Um, it was awesome to get outside of the normal work life that we have and kind of discuss some different things and um, definitely some different insight of, honestly, kind of, again, what avenues I have available to me in my everyday work practice, which I kind of didn't know I did until we kind of sat down and chopped it up a little bit tonight, which is awesome. Right. Um, and I think that goes to show just how important it is to meet the, re- or to kind of find the resources you have, talk to the individuals and the professionals that are available to you and how you can formulate a plan, a team to make the best environment for the mental health of your student athletes, your patients, or whomever you're working with, because without it, this wall is going to always be built, be up. And I think that was kind of the idea of tonight is to break down that wall a little bit and let's talk about what we have available to us. Right. Um, And I think we outlined a lot of stuff and it's like one of those where you got to go back and maybe go back again and kind of pick up different little listen to it again yeah 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 yeah. and just be be familiar with those sources Mm -hmm. right because when the time comes you want to be you want to just you want to have it in your back pocket right and ready and with all the different hotlines and stuff we'll make sure we have that all in the show notes so we have it's in our description everything so it's more easily accessible so you don't have to like kind of jot down with a piece of pencil while we're going through it um but i think uh that should wrap up our show tonight. So before we go ahead and close out our tab, um, we just want to give a quick last shout out to our sponsors, Virtua Orthopedics um, at virtua.org slash ortho. They have the right doc for you. They have everything covered. Um, Neck of the Woods Brewing Company serving us up the greatest cold beer on this super, super hot day. And Timber Real Productions helping us put together um, this podcast, our video, audio, and everything else. And again, thank you, Dr. Ballard, for joining us. It was a great time. And uh, we'll see you next time, folks.